All right, you ready? Ready. Hi, everybody. This is Elizabeth Wallace with PixelatedGeek.com, and we're talking with a man who is the composer behind such TV shows as Family Guy, such video games as Uncharted 1, 2, and 3, and also, probably most importantly to us, the composer behind the main theme and the score to Joss Whedon's Firefly. How are you doing today? I'm Mr. doing fine. Greg Edmondson. Happy to be here. A lot of people aren't familiar with how people get to be the composers for certain shows. How did you get to work on Firefly? Were you approached or did you have sort of a battle royale with other composers to fight for the honor? Or how did that happen? It's always a different story. There's never one story fits all. For whatever reason, everybody, of course, wanted to work with Joss. He was just coming off of Buffy and Angel. And yet, their office wouldn't take calls from any agents. So you sent in some music, and then they said, we'll get back to you. Right. Well, as you know, about the time you send it in, you've moved on to something else because you never expect that call to come. Right, right. And yet it did. And I met with Joss, and we had such a wonderful time together that by the end of that meeting, he said, call your agent and tell him you got the gig. That's what it never happens that way in the music business, ever. Did he have a real clear idea of what he wanted from the music for the show? He, he, he did, and yet he was wide open to things, too. He knew that because his vision was a post-apocalyptic world where all the cultures were thrown together, that we could mix any and every kind of music together as long as the picture justified it. So you could mix Chinese banjos with Western stuff, with all of this. And a lot of times in television, people say, I want to do something that's never been done before, something completely different. Right. And they never do. Right, right. Joss right. said it and meant it and wanted to, to break the, boundary, the boundaries. And had that show gone the way that it should have gone. When I first looked at the two-hour pilot, I said, I'm working for 10 years. Oh, yeah. 10 years, I've hit the goal line. Little did I know it was going to be closer to 10 episodes. Right, right. But had it gone, it was just starting to find its legs. We were just starting to find what worked musically and what worked with the script-wise. Right. It was such a joy. It was such a great joy. And I'm so thankful that, that Josh took a chance on me right, and right. hired me. It was one of the thrills of my life and continues to be. And it's to our benefit, too, because it's such a favorite theme from everyone. You wrote the music for the theme. Did Joss write the lyrics on no, that? No, I didn't write the music. Joss wrote the whole theme. I'll be darn. A lot of I people... wrote everything else. <laughs> but he wrote, he wrote the theme, and he always had a different vision. Again, welcome to television. His vision was always to have a single black man sitting on a front porch kind of rocking in a chair, singing this, you know, you can't type, take the sky for me thing. Exactly. And, and of course Fox said, oh no, this is an action show. We have to have some kind of action in it. So a compromise was reached. And a lot of times that's what happens in television. But his vision was the right vision for that show. Absolutely. One of the reasons that Fox didn't like it is they wanted an action show with lots of action. And Josh was writing a show with these incredible moral conundrums. You know, yeah. people who sometimes did the wrong thing, but in the long in the long range, they did the right thing. Exactly. exactly. And you go, that's a show that hadn't been made before. You know, Very but true. you know, there you go. In both Firefly and in Uncharted, there's a real Eastern element to a lot of the writing. Is that a style that you're really comfortable writing in? It's a style that I kind of developed on Firefly, right. and then especially on Uncharted 2, where we were set in Tibet. It justified. All of the, I just love ethnic, ethnic instrumentation, not as a whole score, just as little flavors, because it makes you feel like you're not in Kansas, you know. What, what would you say is the craziest instrument you've ever composed oh with? Oh, Lord, I don't know the answer to that. They're all, <laughs> they are all crazy. But one of the great benefits of Los Angeles, there are so many magnificent players. If there's an instrument, there's somebody here who plays it. Right. And it's, been a, it's, it's always a joy working with them Wonderful. because you learn. Yeah. You know, music is a team sport just like everything else. It's not, I'm the composer and they're other than... I benefit from the wonderment of all the great musicians. That's, that's just lovely. It, it, it's, it's a team sport, and, and you get credit for it, but it was their genius, the fact that they spent their whole life learning how to play that instrument. That's exactly. fantastic. So your fans would love to know what projects you're working on next so we can find you wherever you go. You know what? It, it, I, it, in video games, you can't talk about the project for, for a specific reason. Uh, you know, in film or TV, if you do a show that doesn't work, it has an afterlife. Sure. You know, it goes to DVD. Yes. With Firefly still on DVD. It goes to cable. Video games are much more unusual. If you don't hit big, 
it's gone. Yeah. So they try really hard. They cost so much money. They try really hard to control every aspect of the release of it, which right. is why that happens. Right. But you know what? I'm, I'm, I've been doing video games almost exclusively for 10 years because they give you budgets. Uh, that yeah. you all, you know, so I've recorded at Abbey Road, done all these fantastic things with big orchestras, but I miss the world that I came from, but, film and TV. So I don't want to eliminate anything, but I want to go back and do more of that. One of the things in Firefly, the schedule was, was ridiculous. I would get up sometimes really early in the morning and I would sit down and never once when I turned on that screen yeah. and saw our guys, yeah. I said, I am the luckiest guy in the world. Oh, this is awesome. so cool. Yeah. I am, you know. <laughs> and when it was over, I literally, I went in Joss's office and literally cried like a little baby. I hear that's a reaction from a lot of people, anybody involved with the project. I was so tired and I cared so much. Yeah. And I just, I knew that I wouldn't make a lateral move. I could go get another show. Yeah. But I knew it was not going to be the same show. But at least it had, you know, more than 10 years later, it's still around. It's People astonishing. still following. It's it. astonishing. The fact that I'm standing here today after 10 years is absolutely amazing to me. And I, I, I laugh because I don't know. I mean, I've done a gazillion things before and a gazillion things since. None of them have ever had the life or the generosity of spirit. Yeah. All of the things that you live for. Thank goodness that you got to be involved with it because you created something that just everybody really loves. I was the luckiest guy on the planet. And we, don't, we know you have an autograph signing here at WonderCon 2015, so we don't want to keep you too long. But thank you very much for talking with us Joy today. was all mine. We really appreciate it. Thanks for watching, you guys.